Hi, I'm Karen. We're a sharf. And Karen, your your name, Karen. We were talking about your folks, and I asked you if you had any idea where Karen came from. I have absolutely no idea. That was just a name they picked that they liked. Okay. Why why don't you tell us a little bit about why you don't know so much about your early childhood experiences? Um, I grew up in Borough Park um, until I was about five years old when we moved out to North Bayshore. Uh, my parents were older and they had lost a child. And for that reason, I don't really know too much about my family history. And that, and that was your brother? That, that was my brother who passed away when he was six. Yes. So that's, that is all a blur. You were, how old were you at that time? I was three and a half. All right, no wonder, okay. Um, presently, your family situation, however, is, uh, we're here in Brightwater. So why don't you tell us about how you came to, to uh, live here? Um, my husband and I were married in 1974. And your husband's name is? My husband's name is Martin. And Marty and I decided we wanted to find a house that was close to the railway, close to Brentwood, and we found Brightwaters, and we've lived here for 37 years, and all of our children grew up in Brightwaters. And speaking of all of your children, tell me about all of the children. Who are they? That Name them, and tell me a little bit about each one. My daughter, our oldest child is Kristen, and she's 34 years old, and she is a kindergarten teacher in Eastport South Manor School District. My middle child, Jennifer, will turn 30 in March. And she is an American history teacher, and she lives in Massachusetts with her husband. And my youngest child is Brian. He just turned 22 and graduated from Stony Brook with a degree in secondary English education. And we'll start graduate school next week. Okay. And I, have they are they very much modeling their mom and dad and the things that they're doing or the way they do what they do? Do you see certain patterns? No, I see them. They are three really distinct, different children. And they're all very, they're strong in different ways. And my oldest always wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. That's what she wanted to do. Huh. She couldn't get a job here. She moved to Hawaii for a year on her own, taught there, and then came back and was able to get a job uh, on Long Island, my uh, my middle daughter, her original degree, her undergraduate degree is in uh, international relations and French. And then after she spent some time at uh, Northeastern going for an MBA, she decided she wanted to teach history. So she went back to BU for a degree in secondary um, history. And my son's always wanted to do something with writing. He's written books, and he wanted to wanted to teach. So that's really. When you say he's written books, he's written a trilogy, and he writes poetry. His book is out being shopped to publishers, but he, so far, I mean, okay. we know it took uh, Dr. Seuss 128. That's right. Yeah. Times before, but but he's he's really interested in writing and literature, and that's his passion. Now you mentioned. When we were talking before, that you were the only, you are the only child of uh, your parents, yes. uh, because you lost your brother when he was just an, a child himself. Um, where, how did you get to Brightwaters? Because I know you mentioned North, you mentioned Bayshore, and you mentioned having attended school in Brentwood. So fill in that missing those years. There. Those years. Well, I uh, I grew up in Brentwood. North Bay Shore, Brentwood School District. And Your folks moved there after Floral Park. After Floral Park. And we moved there in around 1956 when it was really, everything was, Brentwood was expanding very rapidly. Yeah. I started at Southwest Elementary and then there was overcrowding. So then I was moved to Northeast, which is way on the other side of town. Then I was moved to Southeast because that school was crowded and they were building South Elementary. And at that point, my parents didn't want me moved anymore. So I went to St. Anne's, went to St. Anne's until eighth grade. And then I went to West, it used to be West Middle School. Now it's West, no, it used to be West Junior High. Now it's West Middle School. And then from West, I went to Brentwood High School 
and I attended college at uh, Suffolk Community in Dowling. And then when I met my husband, we decided that we wanted to have a house that was ours together, not just my house or his house. So we started looking around and Brightwaters was a very convenient community. Um, we thought there was a train station in Brightwaters. There wasn't, because at that time my husband was working in Manhattan. And so we moved here and then found out that the train station really was in Bayshore. But, um, so we've been here and it's a great, how, how great did community. You guys, how did you guys meet? We met at a Christmas party. His friend wanted to go to the party. My friend wanted to go to the party. He had a car, I had a car. They connected and we kind of just spent the night hanging out together because it was, they took off and we, that's how it happened. Okay. Uh, to, to nail it down in terms of, of specific information, what year were you born, Karen, and where were you born? I was born 1950, March 17th, 1950, and I was born at Mineola Hospital. Okay. Do you have something that you could point to as an earliest memory? Now, you mentioned things happening to you at the age of three, so it, I don't know how long around that time after uh, your first memories might have begun to stick. I remember the day we moved from Floral Park. You do. And because our house in Bayshore wasn't finished, so we moved to one of my aunt's houses. Uh, one of, uh, we first moved to East Meadow, and we lived there for a while. Then we moved to North Babylon. I started second grade in North Babylon. And then I, our house was ready around October, so we moved to Bayshore in October. So I remember kind of the, you know, the caravan of moving yes. and leaving the house. And, and what was the development? In, in Greenwood Knolls. Greenwood Knolls. It was right off Manitoba Boulevard. Now, how was it that uh, you would, you remember attending an elementary school for first grade, I think you said, in a Polish school in Floral I, Park? I did. I attended St. Hedwig School in Floral Park, and that was because it was very close to where I lived. And uh, my, my parents had lived in Floral Park for quite some time, from the time my father um, came home from World War II. That's when they bought the house, and they lived there until we moved in 1956. Now, one of the questions that I will ask people that I think in your case takes on a particular different uh, connotation is um, what, are the, what are the lessons that you learned from growing up in your family? But in your instance, in your case, your family had almost dissolved. It wasn't even there for you um, as a child. That had to be a teacher also because you became you became almost the adult, whether you wanted to or not, when you were living in Bayshore at 19 years of age. You were paying the mortgage and, and, uh, and was solely responsible for, I guess, for, for everything. Is that not true? It's true, but I think as things are happening, you just do what you need to do. And I don't think I really gave it much thought. It's, it was just, you it is a, what it is and you do what you need to do. And I don't think I really, I don't think I really thought about it very much at the time. It was right, just, exactly. it was, you know, for all yeah. of us, we have right. certain times in our lives when there are certain realities that are there and that was it. And how was it, Karen, that you decided to uh, become a teacher? Oh, I started, when I started Suffolk Community, I was a business major. So I took typing, shorthand, business communications, all of those courses, and I needed a part-time job. So I was able to get one in Brentwood as a student worker. And I worked at the old administration building. I worked, um, Mary Villar was one of the first people I worked with, and she used to give me photocopying to do. Then there was elementary summer school in those days, and we had 10 schools in Brentwood at that time that we ran elementary summer school. And Andy Caruso was the elementary summer school principal. And Andy hired me, so I would work part-time from March to June. And then I would work June, July, and August. And I did everything that he needed to be done. I did the purchase orders, I did, I typed the observations. I just, I was like the office person. And he was the one who really 
inspired me. And he would say to me, you know, you ever think about being a teacher? You ever think about this? And when it was time for me to, when I finished at Suffolk Community and I transferred to Dowling, that's when I really became interested in becoming an elementary teacher. But he was really the one, what I learned in that office was, was amazing. Things I never knew. Um, things about children's literature, things about reading. Uh, he was a great, great resource for me. He really was. Yeah. And working in the different elementary schools because he was a GIS, which was a general instructional supervisor. And they later became the reading consultants that we have in Brentwood. But he, um, he was in village school. We were at um, what's now IMC or used to be IMC. Yes. We were at North Elementary. We were at Southeast. So I, I really got to see. Now, this was as you were still in high school. No, actually, this it started when I was my first year of college. Okay, so all of that's when you do. That's okay. when I started it. Mm -hmm. And your first year of college as an undergraduate was at what what institution? Or Suffolk what? Community College. Okay, that's right. You mentioned that. Um, is there a Dowling connection here or something? Yes, after I finished um, Suffolk Community, I transferred to Dowling. Okay. And that's when I, I declared a major for education. Uh -huh. All right. Well, you've had a lot of decisions to make as an educator, and I wonder if, uh, if you can point to one or a couple of them that were really difficult decisions for you to make at the time. I'm sure there were some decisions that were no-brainers. So you just, you knew. If you knew you wanted to teach, if you decided that in advance, um, then that decision didn't even have to be made. It was made before you embarked upon your your career. But in the various, well, why don't you, walk, you know, a better question would be, walk us through the years. How many years did you actively serve as a as a teacher or as an educator? That's that's really hard to pin down because I was hired in 1972. So I worked at South Elementary School as a first grade teacher for two years. South Elementary School closed. Then I was sent to Pine Park and I taught second grade there. Then I was accessed. And um, I was hired back in February of the following year to Northwest Elementary, which closed. Um, then I was accessed again, and I was hired back in November. I taught first grade at North Elementary. Then I was accessed, and I was accessed for three years that time. So I was out of work for three years. Then I was hired back, and I was hired as a first grade teacher at Oak Park. And then I was accessed. And then I was hired back the first day of school to Pine Park, which I had been at before. So this was like... Then I was accessed for a year. And then I was hired back and I was at Loretta Park for probably 18 years. So that was my that was my long-standing school. When I was accessed, I taught business subjects at Briarcliff, which is a business college. So I taught at Briarcliff in Hicksville and I taught at Briarcliff in Patchogue. And then in 2002, I left the classroom and became the assistant coordinator for language arts and staff development. So I moved to the Felicio building and I was there for six years and that's when I and retired. And that was your last appointment. So that, that was my last appointment. Yes. Okay. So I, I kind of made the rounds of Brentwood. You certainly did. And you hung in there too. Yep. Yep. Uh, what kept bringing you back? I mean, with having been accessed so many times, you, somebody might have thought, why don't you leave already? Do something else. I almost did. I was offered, because I have a business background, I was offered this job as an administrative assistant to a wine merchant. And it was a really, it was, it was a great salary. And I really considered doing it. And my husband is the one who said, do it if you want. But if you want to teach, just hang in there. Because eventually, your job will become secure. Boy, and I don't know if I good advice. Yeah, wow. I don't know if I believed him at that time. Yeah. But you know, it was so I really I, I do. He's he's the reason I I didn't, you know, leave and go to the corporate world. Tell me talk a little bit about your husband. Tell me about him. Um he's a, a 
he's a really kind, caring man mm -hmm. who um, he used to be in purchasing and they used to call him the Perry Como of purchasing because he's just a very calm person who just sees a problem, figures it out and moves on. I've never seen him lose his temper. I've never seen him uh, really lose it with the kids uh, when when things weren't don't go well. Yeah, it affects him, but he never ever takes it out on anyone else. And I have I really I, I admire him a lot because he he really uh, he's a good person. He so he, yeah. he treats every every person he encounters the same way. Has has he retired from what he did, or is he? He left the corporate world. He did. He left the corporate world uh, probably about seven years ago. My husband, we always kid, my, my passion is literacy and my husband's passion is blood. My husband's been a platelet donor for years, blood donor, platelet donor. And he always wanted to do something that had, like in the corporate world, you really, you make decisions and things that you do really are important, but it's not like, uh, and he always wanted to do something that he felt had more meaning. So he uh, has been a platelet donor for years. And he um, went to work for New York Blood Services. And what he does is he goes into schools and he does a program called uh, Young Physicians or Little Docs. And it's a PowerPoint presentation and it, they tie blood donation in with teaching kids about the circulatory system. And he also speaks at churches and uh, that's what he does. So he's sort of semi-retired and that's what he does. All right, wonderful. Wow. Did you? Or game that you liked to play when you were when you were a kid? Parcheesi. Really? Parcheesi. Okay. <laughs> the years that you were teaching and then you were being accessed and then you were coming back and you were teaching, did you ever receive from one of your students a gift that you remember to this day? The gifts that I remember the most are letters that they wrote there's one like up on my wall there and it's a poem that one of the kids wrote and like those are the things that mean yeah. the most it's not it's not the things but and and cards and letters from parents um especially the cards and letters from parents who you thought didn't really like the way you handled situations when you get a thank you card for that that's like really that that means the most it's, I used to call those paydays. <laughs> yeah. uh, speaking of payday, do you remember your very first job? My very first job was Brentwood. I was this, I, I worked as a student worker mm -hmm. and I was in college, but I had, had gotten the job. A friend of mine had worked in Brentwood and she kind of, you know, told me you should, you should try to become a, you should try to work and you won't work all the time. But, you know, we used to help okay. uh, Virginia Daytree collate the budget. That's yes. when we used to collate the budget by hand. That was my very first job in Brentwood was going there on Friday and Saturday going to, I think it's what used to be IMC. Yeah. And we, we collated the budget by hand. We would all walk around the table. Was that must have been like minimum wage or something? $2.12 like an hour. There you go. To twelve, mm -hmm. and when I worked in, in the summer school program, it went up to two forty three an hour. What were your after school interests when you were in school? What'd you like to do when when the when the school ended? I really, um, I was a big reader. Okay. And your favorite subjects in school would have been <sighs> English and history. Yes. Okay. Now, did you have a least favorite subject? Hate to say it, but it's probably math. Okay. Probably math. Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't be alone in that category. <laughs> I think I could join those ranks at one time in my life too. What about uh, what about uh, uh, I don't know if this is an appropriate question even, but did did you have a favorite toy that you remember? Uh, I had a stuffed animal that um, I was given in um, the, one of the last Christmases we were in the House of Floral Park okay. and it was um, this, this great big French poodle. Oh, 
And I used to carry that around with me all the time. And when we moved, I used to take that when we would uh, go looking at houses. I bring Gallipucci with me. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, great. How about, Karen, how about um, the favorite time of year, uh, then and now? Is it the same season as it used to be, or has that changed? I think as a kid, summer is what, you know, what you live for. And now I would say it's probably fall into this season. Yes. I don't like the snow that much anymore, but I do love autumn. Tell me about what has given you over this over the years now, you said it would be difficult to pin down a number uh, because you were accessed and then rehired, but you, it, it had to be a couple of decades at least that you were there. I think um, it was like 38 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I was hired in 1972 and I retired in 2008. Mm -hmm. And of course there were, there were times sure. that I was here, part right. of the time, whatever. Right. So, you know, according to the retirement system, it's one number. According to Brentwood, it's another number. Yes. But it's around 38 years that I spent. What, what would you point to um, in that span of years? What would you point to as providing for you a, your greatest sense of accomplishment? That's hard because it changes with each. Yep. Uh, I think as a beginning teacher, it's really, th those are the hardest years and you don't really know if you're any good or not. You really, uh, you think, you think, you go into the classroom thinking you know what to expect and you really don't. If you're really lucky, you work with people who kind of guide you along. I was really lucky. I worked at South Elementary and Pete Demento was my first administrator. And he was a fabulous principal for a first year teacher because he provided guidance and he also gave suggestions, but he kind of let you feel your way. And I, I would say he was making it, teaching first in first grade for two years, I learned a lot. Um, as far as other accomplishments, every year is different. The group dynamic, you might, what works one year, might not work the next year because of the group dynamics of your class, especially with elementary, yes. especially with um, the way things change. You know, we went from teaching three reading groups to four reading groups to doing whole class flexible grouping to doing balanced literacy to doing all different things. And I think just really keeping up with what's new and, and, and always remembering that professional growth and professional development. And that's something that, you know, you really need to do. So I don't know, that, that's a okay. tough question. Okay. That one I'm, okay. um, you stumped me on. Is it, is it true that cursive writing was left behind somewhere that, that there wasn't time for it anymore? It's, it's funny because usually cursive was taught in third grade. Yeah. Then Brett would brought in this really great program called ARL. And we started teaching cursive in kindergarten because it developmentally, it's easier for the students to do that. So cursive was taught then. Now I don't think we do ARL anymore. So I don't know. I think it probably is one of those things that as we, as things get more jam packed, yeah. things, okay. you know, we, we always bring in new programs, but you can't squeeze it all in. Yeah, so exactly. the same way as I sometimes, you know, history and that's right. History and geography. Yes, my husband's a big one on they don't teach geography yes. anymore. But they do. It's just well, done in a different way. Well, it wasn't funded since 1980, so that has a lot to do with it. I know, as I said, one of my, my daughters is, is a history teacher. Yeah. And um, she's aghast sometimes that, yeah. you know, that no one knows about the Korean conflict. That's true. That is true. Or maps. Nobody knows yeah. maps anymore. What was the worst professional day that you can remember experiencing for any reason? I mean, we all have good days. We have bad days. Overall, I think most of them are good days. But there is that one or two experiences that kind of stands out. Um. That's hard. September 11th was very difficult. I taught first grade. I was doing my administrative um, building 
part then the part of it and um, parents were picking ch children up and um, I, I think that was probably a hard one because in addition to you know your, the students that we all have our own experiences with people who were we didn't know where they were so they're announcing a new movie this year Tom Hanks is uh, behind a new movie uh, commemorating or about that day. And I can't help but wonder um, about the people who were so personally uh, touched by it, how this movie will be. Of course, flashbacks and all sorts of negative things. Well, the 9-11 Foundation has basically put out something that says, be very cautious if you're going to go and see this movie. And the book, I don't know how close it is to the book. Okay. You know, I would. I don't know. You know, we um, because of where we live, many of the, many of the people from the church we used to go to were worked in the city. My husband at one time worked across the street from the World Trade Center. He left after the '93 bombing. So, you know, it brings back. You bet. So sure. that I would say that was a difficulty. As far as other things, you know, it's. Uh, you have difficult days when you throw up your hands and say, what was I thinking? I know. And then you have those days that are so wonderful and you say, aha, yes. that's why. So. Have you, were you ever afraid to go to work in Brentwood? No, never. Okay. Never. I, remember, I, I grew up in Brentwood. Yes. I grew up in North Bay Shore, Brentwood School District. I went to Brentwood schools. Uh, for me, that was my community. Right. If you hadn't taught and become public servant, as it were. What do you suppose another choice of career might have been? Well, I started at Suffolk Community in the business. Yes. And that was what I had planned to do. I okay. was going to, I was okay. going to be a secretary. Okay. And, um, okay. And, and then decided once you met certain people along the line that this would be something you'd enjoy even more. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because my father had said, you can always be, you can always be a teacher, and again, my thought was, I don't think so. Uh, okay. Um, was there an interview that you had to undergo to become a teacher? Yes. Um, as I said, I, I worked for Andy Caruso, yes. and as I finished my last year working for him, I graduated from Dowling, and there were, really weren't any jobs. It was 1972. There were very few jobs out there and he arranged for, or he and Pete Demento decided that Pete Demento would interview me. So I would have a first interview. So I would know what to expect. And I went into the interview thinking there was no chance of a job here. So it was, it was, it was a long interview. It was over an hour. And we covered a lot of things. I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think of, Exactly what I remember uh, Pete throwing out scenarios like if this happened, what would you do or how would you deal with this or you know what would something about reading. I remember all those things, but I also remember thinking there was not going to be a job. So I had this interview probably in June or July and I finished up summer school, summer school we finished about mid-August and I went on vacation with my cousin and I came back and there was a, had been an opening at South and he offered, I was offered the position and um, Jack Smith was the oh, yes. was the um, HR person I don't think they called them HR in those Pupil days. Pupil personnel. Pupil personnel right. and they offered me and I signed my contract I think it was August 21st mm -hmm. 1972 because that became an issue as we were having so many people being accessed we were actually down to the day and the time that you are, um, that you signed your contract. So yes. Yes. that was, so there was an interview. And now what, once you got that job and you began teaching in the district, uh, did you ever have an epiphany such as, uh, might be, uh, connected to the fact that, wow, this is not what I thought it was when I was a student, I saw it one way, but now that I'm inside and I'm looking at the, I see it differently. Was there any moments like that? 
I think I think your first year teaching those moments come every day because in college no one no one tells you especially in elementary no one teaches you about teaching writing that's a big thing you know it, it's that's so crucial and nobody in, in college I never took a course on how to teach especially first graders how do you teach writing not not printing but how do you actually teach writing and uh teaching reading it's like here are the manuals good luck and uh, you know now i know a lot more but if i didn't know i i think about it and i sometimes wonder about those poor those first couple of years of classes i hope those kids are okay <laughs> but 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 uh the preparation from the perspective of teacher training uh, until you get into the classroom to do the student teaching, it's all so hypothetical and so abstract. It's, um, I don't wonder, I wouldn't be surprised if no one is prepared properly until they can get in there and learn through, you know, real life experience as to well, how you encounter things. Well, there's also that, and if you think about it, teaching is a very insular profession. Yeah. Uh, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, you kind of have almost a mentor and you work, you might, you might have assistants and you're working, seeing people. In teaching, we go in our classrooms and we don't always have time to meet with other teachers. That's one thing when I, when I worked in the administrative part, the staff development part of it was teachers never have a chance to get together and share. And that's a big part of learning, the is learning from other people. Exactly. And the difficulty that Brentwood had too was because the elementary schools were on one time frame and the high school secondary was on another. Mm -hmm. And whereas you would love to bring them together to, for, to realize how one is affecting the mm -hmm. other. Uh, the minute the school ended, people were gone and they wouldn't stay and couldn't stay because the yeah. next group was still in the classroom. Right. And also very there's so much preparation and so many things that teachers need to do on their prep periods you know you, yes. you you call parents you make photocopies you grade papers you meet with some of the pull-in people you don't have time to go into someone's room and talk about well let what are we doing as far as this curriculum you don't have time to share or to really just see what other people are doing sometimes i mean each one of our schools brentwood strength has always been their staff i i've worked with so many amazing people in brentwood but you never really get a chance to meet with them because they're busy teaching you're busy teaching and brentwood was great as far as a lot of times when we had our staff development days uh, way back we would have actual teachers present and you could sign up for workshops that they were doing and you would really get to see the strength of Brentwood and and that hasn't happened for a while I don't know what you know I, I'm out of it yes, for four years so I don't right. really that's know right. yes. and but staff you know professional development is so crucial and very often we get caught up in what we do and that part that's that's the part that we drop the ball on sometimes Did you, I, think. I know you had job descriptions for whatever position you held whether it was on the line mm -hmm. in the classroom or in an administrative capacity. But the job description didn't quite get to what it was that brought you to work every day, what your purpose was. What were you trying to achieve? Um, can you answer that question for either one or any one of the roles that you played? What was your, what did you try to achieve? What were you well, I guess as a teacher, you really just you you want your students to be prepared especially in the younger grades you you really you're teaching reading and writing you're teaching those basic skills that without those skills they can't they, by the time you got them in high school you wanted them to be able to read you wanted them to be able to write you wanted them to have some sense of comparing contrasting a, a, an understanding and those are the things that elementary teachers work it every day. And that, I guess that's part of it is a love of literature, a love of learning, becoming a lifelong learner. All the things that sound, you know, it, it sounds almost trite, but it's not, you know, you have to keep, you have, you want to, you want them to know that they, 
that learning doesn't just stop when you leave school or when for the summer. You want them you want them to just Absolutely. love finding out about new things and that's really But if you can communicate your love for those things, they will pick up on it. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important for for educators to be passionate about whatever it is that they do mm -hmm. because that's contagious. And I'd say the administrative position that was that was probably the, the best administrative job in Brentwood because I got to do all the fun things like go into classrooms and work with teachers and and do staff development. You know, I didn't have the I didn't I didn't have to deal with some of the things yes. that a building principal has to deal with. They have a hard job. I had the fun job. Yes. I think very often uh, teachers don't realize um, that that administrators are not part of the dark side as as often people teachers will think of administrators as the, the, the evil empire you know that's what my husband said to me when i took the job he said oh you're going over to the dark side well that's the misperception i mean the, the, clearly there are different hats that you wear and with that new hat comes a whole level of awareness that you may not have been privy to before. I was I was fortunate because the, the position and the people I work with, um, they just they made it easy for me to do my job. They really did. Uh, the people that I work with. So. Um, would it be fair to say that um, that besides your work in the classroom and your work at, at the third floor of the administration building, you had. You were also uh, involved in different activities or programs uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. I've been um, a member of Suffolk Reading Council longer than I can uh, even remember. I'm a past president of Suffolk Reading Council. Um, I've, I've done presentations. I've presented at International Reading Association in Atlanta and in Chicago. That was over the last couple of years. Hmm. Presented at New York State Reading, uh, presented at BOCES. So I've done, that's been part of, of what I've done, all, you know, literacy-based okay. and, presentations. And, and, and you mentioned several grade levels that you taught, too. Yeah, I taught kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, and then, of course, you know, during some of my accessing times, I would come back and, you know, do one grade level for a couple of weeks, another grade level until, so it pretty much during those days when you were accessed, you didn't have any uh, real connection to, well, I, I'm a second grade teacher. It was if they offered you a fifth grade in whatever building, if you were next on the list, you took that job because if you didn't, yeah. you went to the bottom of the list again. So we became very flexible in what we did and, you know, just. Have you been as flexible in retirement as you were back then too? I think so. Did you approach retirement with a purpose? Did you have a goal? Were you headed in a certain direction, or did you just want to take it as it came? I made my decision the very last day at 12 o'clock. I went up to the third floor and gave my, my papers to Christy Tadaldi as she was walking out the door. It was I thought about it. I had the papers in my desk for a while, and when I went to work in the morning, I didn't know if I was going to put them in or not, and I just made the decision. Wow. And and I can't tell you if you ask me why did I decide to retire when yeah. I did. I have no no reason. I had you thought about it? Had you talked about it with your husband? My husband, I talked about it, and he said to me, "Well, do whatever you want. Just you know, let me know." And he actually thought it was going to be that was going to be my last day. When I called him and said I put in my papers, he thought that June thirtieth was of that year of two thousand seven. Mm. He thought I was going to come home that day, and that was it. He was, I think, you know, mm. surprised when I said, no, it's one more year. I have to give a year. But we talked about it, and I don't know. I honestly, to this day, I couldn't tell you okay. why I decided. Why? It was just something somebody once said to me. You'll know when it's the right time. You'll know. And Was that at a time, <clears throat> Karen, when there were a lot of changes of personnel taking place at the administrative level? Were people leaving, other people there was it was during a time of change um, but actually but that didn't influence your decision no okay. it really it really didn't okay. it, um, I don't yeah. know it just seemed like I, I it sat was, there and it I was said the right thing to do. I think it's a 
it's a good thing to do. I think it's time. And, and I honestly never, I never second guessed what I did. I just made the decision. I, you know, work, had one more year to work and I did that. And, um, mm. and okay. I retired. It's still hard to believe I'm retired, but. What do you miss? I miss the people. I really miss the Do you the, have connections with? Oh people? yeah, I still I still see uh, well obviously Kate Corkery who was my boss. Sure. Uh, I still see her and Barbara Biondo is one of the people that that I still see. I still see a lot of the people, and um, but I miss the people more. And sometimes I I miss just learning like some of the new stuff. But I keep busy. I, I do consulting and. That keeps you me mentioned busy. consulting with Scholastic. I do consulting for Scholastic. I also do some work uh, occasionally with BOCES. Um, Suffolk? Western uh, Suffolk? Eastern, Bo Eastern Eastern Suffolk, Suffolk BOCES. Um, actually, Kate and I did some work up in Greenberg last year. We would go up there and do staff development with uh, in one of their intermediate schools. So I, I do things like that. And, um, and you're having fun. I am having fun. I am having fun. It's... Uh, it's a nice time. I, Were you ever involved in the BTA or BIPSO to any great extent? No, I really wasn't. Okay. I, uh, okay. When I was when I was went back to teaching, when my job finally became, uh, you know, where I knew I was going to have a job, uh, I still had children at home, so that was pretty much. And then sure. I just went back to my administrative, so all of that kind of took my time away from other things and I never really did too much with it. I'm, I'm curious because like your, you describe your husband as being uh, the Perry Como of, of, his, purchasing, of yeah. his purchasing area. Uh, you seem to me to be very, very laid back and very a calming influence on the people that, that you work with. It would strike me that you have that effect. But there must be something that makes you angry. In, in the nature of your work, what you did, when you encountered it, what could push your buttons to make you feel that anger? I, I very rarely, very, very rarely get angry. I get irritated. And I guess if, if something needed to be done and it wasn't wasn't done or if, if it wasn't followed up on those are the kinds of things that would would sort of push my buttons and irritate me but I can't really say angry you know honestly I think most of the people I work with the vast majority everybody worked together that was that was really the strength yes. of, of yes. working in Brentwood and of also having that that long range that, that long association with them you have to remember, I, I was a student there, I taught there, and it was a part of, really, Brentwood's been in my life longer than most people. I, I hear that. Um, you retired, as you said, in 2008, mm -hmm. um, and your last building assignment was uh, at, as an administrator working in and the third on the third floor. no actually i was on the first floor you were okay. i was on oh, the first right. floor you were on the third i was on the first floor oh that's right yes yes you would have been um do you remember your first year's salary in 72 when you began what you made that year it was around seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars i remember because well no maybe it was close to eight thousand because when i was in high school my home ec teacher told my mother uh I should consider being a teacher because you could make seven thousand a year, and uh, actually, home ec was my first interest. Being a home ec teacher is that right? Chemistry killed me. Oh, okay. What was as a as an administrator? You mentioned it before. You said you, you did the fun things. What was the most fun uh, when you were working uh, with training teachers? And, Professional uh, development. Well, the, the staff development and going into the classrooms, working with the students and the teachers was great. We um, ran a program called Welcome to Kindergarten, and it was 
based on the uh, Read Across America, the Cat in the Hat. Yes. And we did that program, and what we did was we invited all of the incoming kindergartners and their parents to come to a site, and we had, um, I usually would have John Farrell, who is a um, singer-songwriter. He would entertain the students and their parents, and then they would move on to do centers, and some of the centers were things like writing their names, um, things things parents could do with their students, with their children, to uh, enhance the kindergarten experience. And we ran it the first year, we invited 1,200 incoming kindergartners, and we had, uh, we actually had the cat in the hat, so we, we rented a costume, and uh, my son very graciously was the cat in the hat in this costume in August <laughs> for four years. And that was like one of the most worthwhile or rewarding things because a lot of a lot of parents don't realize how much kindergarten how much they do in kindergarten and that was just getting the parents to feel welcome at school and to feel like th that there's a partnership between the parents and the school and the students that was probably one of the most fun things i did i think that uh, i have i am in awe of kindergarten teachers for what they have to do oh Absolutely. There is never a moment that you cannot be paying 100% attention to what you're doing. Yeah, especially these days. When I taught kindergarten for a brief time, it was mostly readiness skills. It was half day. Now they do every single curriculum area. The kindergarten teachers are the unsung heroes because... And the energy of those youngsters is mm -hmm. nonstop, flat out, 100 miles an hour every absolutely. minute. Absolutely. Absolutely. I... And you, don't, and you don't want to break that spirit because it is a powerful force no. that you want, to, you, no. you want to encourage. Yeah. What would you do, what would you personally have done differently, if anything? In what respect? Uh, I'm just thinking <clears throat> that, that when you look at the, the width and the breadth of, you, of, the, of your career, either in the classroom when you reflect on that or... Um, you know, in, in the last few years in an administrative capacity, is there anything that you've had second thoughts about, say, you know, I wish I had tried this or I had done that. Did you do, did you cross all the T's and dot all the I's? Are you done? Were you done when you left? Was there anything else that you either didn't have time for, couldn't have accomplished because you lacked the resources or the influence? Oh, well, uh, there are always programs that you wish you could bring in that you, like you don't have the resources. Like, like for example? Uh, uh, technology programs in kindergarten, things like that in first grade. Uh, Is it because Brentwood was the district that it was? I mean, the, we were always behind the economic eight ball and, and never enough money to stretch. There are so many wonderful programs and you can only do so many. And Are you talking real, about time now? Or time, I'm talking about time-wise and resources. Okay. You can... You can't load teachers do with programs, you can't do even though a program you think might be absolutely wonderful. If they they already have a program in place and they're happy with it, you really have to understand that. That that would be, I'd say, you know, there are always there are always programs that come in and you say, wow, this would be great to work with this group, and you have to look at it from the financial aspect. You have to look at it from uh, how is it going to affect the program that's already in place. So there are things that, you know, in the position I was in, I was constantly hearing about new things and there's only so much you can, you can do. And you can only change so many things because change is good, but too much change too quickly. You can't take away the things that work. And that's really, you have to walk that, that line where this is something that works. This is, this is good for the teachers. Exactly. Yes. And professionally, I don't know. I, I think I, I'm sorry I didn't go back to my doctorate. I was I was thinking about it, and then I just didn't do it. So that's something I would say if I had it to do all that, I probably would have done that. Uh -huh. but. Okay. Did you ever have a, 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 somebody who was the equivalent of a hero to you, a role model, somebody who, whose life and work you admired and holds up as a, as a model at least to yourself, in terms of of, uh, of something that you would like to em emulate or 
in whose footsteps you would like to follow? There was, there were so many people. I think one person that sticks out, and it's kind of an odd one, but when I was in junior high, I had come from a private school, and I started junior high in, I guess, ninth grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, I'm not even sure what it was at this time, but it was an English teacher I had, Mr. Gray, and he just had such a wonderful way of working with students. He just really... Now, I never wanted to be an English teacher. I didn't want to work in, in middle school, but I just always remember how kind he was, and he he made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. Okay. What don't you miss? About working? Yeah. Um, I don't miss getting up on those snowy mornings and having to drive. I don't miss Fifth Avenue driving down Fifth Avenue. Um, I don't miss deadlines. I don't miss, um, you know, some of the, the... Was your job stressful as a, in what your last position that you held? Was there stress associated to these things that you're talking about now? Some stress, but not that much. Okay. I had th th that was a fabulous job. It really was. Okay. Um, it was a great job. If you were um, to provide advice to somebody who is coming into either, you can take, you can choose whether to do it from the point of view of a of a teacher just starting out, or someone moving into the last position that you held when you did retire. If you were to provide advice to somebody who was following in your footsteps. What would be the benefit, what could you give them that would be the benefit of your own experience? Only do it if you really want to do it and be prepared. What do you mean by be prepared? Don't ever go into it and not be ready to do what the job is as, as far as the administrative. Go in, go into to meetings, knowing what the purpose is. Somebody in my administrative courses had said, "Don't ever, don't ever call a meeting if you don't have an agenda." And you know, and respect people's time, and even respect people's time in the classroom. Be pre just be prepared and and like what you're doing. That's do your right. homework. Do your homework exactly. You know, all those times when when we got homework and in elementary school and high school, you know, it was, it was prep for, be prepared, do your homework, know, know what's expected of you and, uh, and approach it with empathy for the you, people that you're working with. You said something that was very nice before. You said something very complimentary of the teachers that you have encountered and work with in the Brentwood School District. Have you had much uh, exposure to or an opportunity to meet or watch or, or see teachers from other districts uh, so that you could make that kind of comparison um, that that would bring you to back to look at the teachers in Brentwood to complete to complete the sentence Brentwood teachers are well since I've done the consulting obviously I go into other school districts, not only in New York State, but out of state. I did a lot of work when I first retired, did a lot of work in Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, uh, mentioned Kansas. Um, Brentwood teachers are, they're just unique. They really are. Brentwood strength has always been their teachers. So the teachers give 100%. Um, we have so many amazing teachers that I, I can't even, if you ask me to name, like, you know, the top five, I couldn't because there are so many more than the top five. They are just, they're dedicated. They, they come up with ideas to make, just to make things better. And, you know, I don't know, it sounds effusive, but they really, I mean, I look at it from both sides. I look on it from when I was in the classroom. Um, I, and I can look at it from when I was out of the classroom and working with teachers in all the different schools in Brentwood. They're, they're just, Brentwood teachers are, they just have a sense of, 
community, not just the Brentwood community, but a sense of their own community. And uh, you just you just know as a teacher, anytime that anything tragic happened in our in our with our teachers, Brentwood teachers were the first ones in. Nobody ever thought twice about donating a sick day or donating to help somebody. It just uh, you never I never encountered anybody who was cranky about. Oh, well, they, want, they want a sick day. Everybody just gave it. And it was just a whole sense of what Tony Felicio used to say about the Brentwood family. That was that was true. It was. It was family. You would be able to answer this better than most people because Brentwood, as you said, has been so much a part of your life for so many years. You've seen Brentwood the way it was when you were growing up there. You saw Brentwood the first year that you became a professional in the community. And now when you left in 2008, you saw Brentwood had gone through so many changes in many different ways. And yet Brentwood was still Brentwood. How would you put that in? How could you put that into words when you're trying to describe the changes, what you've seen, how different it is today from what it was and and the way in which, which you've just answered, how it still remains the same. And you were referring to the professionalism and the community sense that teachers brought to the profession and brought to the classroom. Uh, it was family. Uh, is there, what's the biggest change or the difference that you can see? I don't know. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I think about when I was, when I had first started, at the Felicio Center, we had, um, we had a little celebration of 500 staff members were graduates of Brentwood High School, or, or yeah, you know, were graduates of Brentwood High School, and then we all had our picture taken. And, and I think how many of those people have parents or someone that they knew who was close to them who also worked in Brentwood, and I think it just. It just follows through. You have those. You have those shared memories. You. You have a stake. You have an investment in this community, because it's it's where you started. I mean, obviously, uh, I got a good education. Is it still happening, Kim? I think it is. I think, unfortunately, you have a lot of times when publicity, and things, just happen the economic situation we're in now, programs get cut, teachers get cut. When you say publicity, you mean negative press? There's, there's negative press about yeah. almost anything yes. because we're in a bad economy and people just think things are harder for them. And you do get negative publicity about everything. You get negative publicity about the community, you get negative publicity about um, teachers losing yes. their jobs, but that's all across the board. That's not just Brentwood. Right, right. And I think Brentwood just, it hangs in there. It really does. And I don't know if I could say something changed or, mm -hmm. I think it, it's it's the community spirit yeah. that you have. And it might, it might change from time to time, but that community, that sense of community and that working together whether you agree, because I know that there are, there's all kinds of different people who think this should be done or that should be done. But the bottom line is they're tr everybody's trying to make their community a better place. They want it to be a better place for their kids. They want their kids to have an education. They want, they want to, they just want it to is, be their if, place. If, if you were an um, omnipotent authority and could make a change that you, in your opinion, would uh, would like to see in place because it is needed. What would you make possible? What would you see changed? Something that is really needed in, in Brentwood? I would say preschool for all children. Because if they don't have that foundation, you know, you want them to be prepared. And preschool is one of those things. I know we have universal pre-K, but we don't have it for everybody because we can't afford to have it for everybody. I would say that, and I would say after school activities that all kids could go to, 
because that just makes them well-rounded mm. people. Okay. There's Did probably you a million other things I oh, could sure. throw in oh, there. Well, but too, you but know, we're, we're playing with... Uh, make-believe money. Uh, make-believe money. Yeah. Your favorite year, was there one? My favorite year? I don't know. I guess it would be... It would probably have something to do with my family and my children. But that would be my favorite year. The year that they. I guess I, I would have to I would have to pick four of them because. Okay, go ahead. I have pick well, 1974 was the year I was married. Okay. 1977 was when my first child was born. Yes. 1982, my second child, okay. and 1989, my son. Wonderful. What haven't we talked about? What. Did you want to make sure got into this account that we have neglected or I didn't know enough to ask you about that we can talk about for before we finish? I don't know. Okay. I think we've talked about like the important things. We talked about just the sense of community with Brentwood. I think that's important. I think, you know, that uh, obviously growing up there has had a lot to do. I wouldn't have had the life I had if I hadn't moved to Brentwood, I don't see that I would have, it's a community I would have found if I had stayed in Floral Park. And very honestly, I probably wouldn't, I don't know if I would have had the career and, you know, obviously met many wonderful people. And I, it was never my goal to be an administrator. And that just, I sort of just fell into that. And that was, Wonderful. Not something I would have ever, ever thought I would do. How would, how would you like people to remember you? Because this will be part of a, a repository of all your memories as well as all the memories of those people who have served, served for the last second half of the 20th century. How would you like to be remembered? I think just as somebody who did the job and cared about the job and respected the job. Karen, can I please, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time and for your contribution to this effort. Thanks so much. You're welcome.